Coming to you live from the Vegas Video Network Studios, just steps from the Las Vegas Strip, it's Talk Tales with Chris Phillips. Coming up on today's program, one of the most successful producers in Las Vegas, David Sachs. And now a man who's never met a tanning bed he didn't like, Mr. Chris Phillips. Well, thank you folks for acknowledging my habits. Thank you. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to another installment of our little talk show we have here on the Vegas Video Network we call Talk Tales. Hey. <laughs> Where we have a chance uh, once a week live on Monday afternoons at 4 o'clock to sit down, obviously have ourselves way too many cocktails, and get to chat with some of the most interesting characters who make up the fabric of this great city we call Las Vegas. We are so proud to have you. My name is Chris Phillips, and uh, many of you may know me as Zoe Bowie, which I guess is kind of my drinking name on weekends. But, uh, uh, we, we, you know, to be honest with you, I'm so proud to have you not only here, but to be here at all. As Scott, you know, uh, we weren't, nobody was supposed to be here. This was supposed to be the end of the world this week. Yes. They predicted that. So the, the bad news is it did happen. And those of us that are here, it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, I think what they're probably going to figure, if you want my prediction. I do. Um, I would expect that experts, maybe days or months from now, are going to figure out that the Mayan calendar and the ancient ancestors who predicted that it was going to be the end of the world were, in fact, correct. It just wasn't going to be the end of the world. It was going to be the end of Oprah Winfrey's network show. So. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people would consider that to be the end of the world. Exactly. <laughs> so we're proud to be here. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm proud to be here at all this today because uh, uh, we did a little partying last night, Scott. We, of course, we had my vintage Vegas show, which usually means way too many cocktails. But I also got a chance to go to the uh, Billboard Music Awards, as a matter of fact. And I went with a friend of mine, Evander Holyfield, and somehow I got sucked up into the front row. <laughs> oh, that's a great, you know, it looks like a, a, a chaperone for his kids. You know, look at that. I, I don't know how I got down there in that pit. But I had the chance to see all my favorite uh, musical stars. But I, I figured that everybody's so small. It was, so so, it was so funny to watch this, because Melissa was watching it, and she's like, it's, it's Chris! It's Chris in the... I'm like, what are you talking about? I know, I had people he's on, Facebook He's on, me he's on the TV, me. he's on the TV. What, what are you talking about, honey? No, 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 he's right there. All right, all right. And shit, there you were. Well, they came out in the audience, and they saw me, and they said, Zoe Bowie's here. They said, come up to the front. We need a token old guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And so, yeah, but, uh, you know, I, got to, I stood right next to... I, I got to meet Jason Bieber. Just a Jason Bieber. <laughs> I'm so hip with the kids. You know, Justin, Justin Bieber is about the size of my leg, by the way. He's about this tall and that big around. But what a nice kid. Oh, my God. He was so cool. But I uh, had a great time there and, uh, of course, went on to do my show afterwards. And uh, if, you, if you folks have any questions about uh, any of your favorite musical stars or anything for that matter, please feel free to go to our email address. And if you have any uh, uh, suggestions, please go to TalkTales at VegasVideoNetwork.com, and we'd love to have you uh, even join us, if you are watching live, in our live chat room, which if you wish to ask a question or anything, hopefully my guest and I can get back to you with something that resembles an answer. Um, but as a lot of you know, um, Vegas has become uh, probably one of the most exciting cities in the world, and you know, there's no doubt that this has been uh, something from the very get-go that was based on kind of a maverick spirit. And you can do things or experience things here you can't anywhere else in the world. And today, obviously, we have some of the most incredible shopping, uh, the most exclusive restaurants with celebrity chefs, uh, outrageous nightclubs, uh, the gambling, of course, uh, and, and amazing attractions. But for my money, I think what makes Las Vegas more unique than any other place in the world is its entertainment, its shows. And obviously, we have a wide variety of offerings uh, from multi-million dollar production shows to celebrity headlining entertainers to uh, magicians and comedians and whatnot. But if you've ever been to Las Vegas, there is no doubt that you have probably had the occasion to see a show that has been produced by my very special guest today. I can't even believe we uh, are able to suck some of his time out of his very busy schedule. 
from David Sachs Productions. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the one and only Mr. David Sachs with us in the studio. Wow. Welcome. Uh, and you, and the best part about you as a guest is you came bearing booze. You know, I like a show that becomes BYOB. And uh, I would I'm love. Thirsty, that's all. Well, we're, we're so proud to have you. And I'd like to help you celebrate if we could because, ladies and gentlemen, we are sitting here with uh, a producer that is known for having more shows on the strip than any other producer in the history of Las Vegas. If I'm not mistaken, you have currently 14 different shows running. Is that correct? I think so. I don't know how <laughs> you can keep up. Straight. Um, I got to figure this out. And so, yes, yeah, so I Thank should you. say so. Let's, you know, there's nothing like a crown royal with a champagne back. Uh, I don't know how to open this, though. <laughs> That'll help getting home very, very nice. And we uh, have stagehands here? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, who's going to open this thing? <laughs> this is a union play. <laughs> but uh, not, only, figure it out. not only do you have more shows than any other uh, okay. entertainer on the strip, we uh, are proud to say that <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. you were also, if I'm not mistaken, the youngest producer ever to produce a show on the strip in the history of Las Vegas? I think so. Yeah. Is that, uh, how does a person at 17 years old get into producing shows, for goodness sakes? Most people, you know, they're trying to, you know, get through high school and you're out there uh, producing successful shows. How did that all come about, for heaven's sakes? I think it's because my parents made me. They just made me do it. I had, uh, my sister was a magician. Well, my father was a band leader. My mom was a dancer in Follies Bergere and all. Um, my other sisters were both dancers. One wanted to become a magician. She was in Siegfried and Roy's show and then said, really? I could do this. So um, we put a show around her, and I was, gosh, 16, 17 maybe. And um, so I was doing that every night and then going to school all day and back at uh, uh Well, the magic the arm is right. delivering. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Oh, well, please, you know, morning. because we have a big budget here at uh, Talk Tales, we're, we have a wine glass and a paper cup. <laughs> you cannot because be we're nothing but you're no, no. You're the, no. My oh, goodness, oh, are you yeah, kidding sorry. me? Thank you, Chris. Wait, we have a real cup here. Is it dirty? Or no, that's for you. Go ahead. That sounds perfect. It's for you. But uh, yeah, you know, this is so cool to me because I believe in like what I call the maverick spirit of Las Vegas, and your family, in fact, uh, were some of the people who kind of got things off the ground in the early days. I think it's so cool. Your dad, if I'm not mistaken, was a conductor, not just a band director, but for the Rat Pack. Is that true? Yeah, he'd done, oh gosh. What How he used to do was, uh, uh, it was called a um, relief band. So they had like an all-star band of, uh, most of the shows played seven days a week. So these guys, they're the all-star uh, musicians. They would play Follies Bergere one night and Lido another night. And, and then when... Um, Oh, Sinatra, whoever came to town, they, they would bring a few core guys and then pick up a local orchestra. So he would play for all those guys as well, individually and then sometimes in the Rat Pack. And so he played for everybody, Tom, you name it, he played for them. Well, I find that very cool, yeah. obviously. And your mom, I have to say, I looked on your website and I saw a picture of your mother when she was a, a dancer with Paul Berger. Am I allowed to say she's hot? She is hot. 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 She's, gosh, I don't even God. know. Probably kill me if I say it, but she's 70 something. Is she really? And she she, she looks, looks great. She looks amazing, yeah. Well, good for you. So obviously yeah. you were no doubt influenced by your family yeah. growing up here in Las Vegas, being in the show business, so to speak. So you started out at 17 years old. You produced your sister, who, Melinda. Yep, Melinda, first lady of magic. First lady of magic, and uh, she was the number one female magician in the world, thanks to you yep. starting it off. That's unbelievable. Yeah, well, you know, she doesn't see it that way. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> <laughs> we fight all the time. No, but uh, yeah, it, it was amazing being in high school and then going to work every night and I didn't know, I didn't even understand what was going on. I was just there and, and working and doing lights and sound and stage and going around to all the brokers and trying to please sell show tickets for my yeah, sister. Yeah, that's so cool. And then, and then it branched off obviously it's, from yeah, there. You, just went in you, there. Went into, you went to California, you were... Well, we had, I, I did my sister's show and then I put a couple other shows together when I was, gosh, I don't know, 17, 18 and then uh, just kept doing more and more shows. You just kind of kind of fell into it and I had a lot of flops and made a lot of mistakes. I remember I liked Duran Duran when they came out. And I was a huge Durani. Well the audiences in Vegas didn't. I thought <laughs> I put together shows with music I liked and then I realized oh yeah the people who buy show tickets are 50 year olds and, and up and so, so you expanded you, you, you know, if I'm not mistaken by the time you were 30 years old you'd produced 25 different shows. 
both here and, and in Japan. And oh, I've, yeah, I've had, Holy cow. I've had about 30 something at the same time. And then I had kids and decided I can't be away that much. So just focus here in Vegas mostly. I'll do. Well, thank God you did because as a result, if I'm not mistaken, back in, I think it's 2004, you opened up what was called the V Theater. Yeah. Now, this was at, originally at the Venetian, correct? Yep. I started, uh, so working and seeing all those production shows and everything, as a kid, my favorite part was the specialty acts or the comedians and I just couldn't wait to see that and I always since high school I said you know I want a show with nothing but acts no you know dancers no production no anything just the acts to me they were the best part of the show everybody thought I was in the crazy. true spirit of Vegas with a variety of different things and so yeah uh, so I put that together at the Venetian and it was phenomenally successful and and then I needed the Venetian was tearing down the showroom to build for Blue Man Group so I had to find a place, and as you know, everything's turned to Cirque, and yes. so I couldn't find a place because if I wasn't French-Canadian, they didn't want me, so <laughs> I bought my own place. <laughs> Trust me, I know the feeling. Um, so I, if I'm not mistaken, is your very first show that you put into the V Theater the, the ultimate variety show yes. that you're talking oh, about here? Yeah, the show was so successful, and I needed a place, and I, I went everywhere, and nobody understood you know they just wanted Cirque so I said all right I'm gonna buy my own theater That's and incredible. pay all that so I, I you know I didn't really want to spend all that money <laughs> but once you do it and you go wow I could do whatever I want I have my own theater I could have the greatest customer service my box office my ushers my everything I could theme it I could do whatever I want and I didn't have to ask permission from the hotel and and marketing I could do whatever I want marketing and so I liked it I mean you know there's downsides I have to pay for all of it but it's a lot I to bite like off, running. my friend. So when it you own is. your own theater and you do your own show, you realize, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of out other hours through the, the day and the night. Oh, right. So why not just do a show back to back to back? Is that the theory? Yeah, well, you know, I, what you're doing once I bought the theater and you're paying for it 24-7 and I had one show in there and I go, yeah, I better put another show in here and another and another because I have to make ends meet. It's very expensive to run a theater. So that's why I end up putting more and more shows in there to keep that going. I, I find, that, find this very interesting. Being a producer, you know, I'm, I'm an entertainer. I'm a performer. I don't produce anything but uh, DUIs. <laughs> um, <laughs> Man. How does one uh, go about producing a show? Do you find the acts? Do they come to you? Do you put them together? Both. Uh, how does that work? Every way you can think of. I get pretty much thousands of ma magicians because I've done so sure, many magic shows. Sure will will uh, send me their tapes or emails with their YouTube clips and and then I also seek out and look and watch and just always trying to find what's out there that's well, the talent I think I have is just knowing what would sell well I think that there's a lot of aspiring entertainers that want to have a show that I know that are wanting and eager to speak with you one of those I think is on the line right now in our live chat room and oh, if you right. don't, would you mind taking a question we have uh, hey Scott who do we have that wants to talk to David FD, FD is a, a longtime watcher of the show, and uh, we've talked in the past about the concept of four wall deals. Mm -hmm. And FD wants to know, you know, are there any lounge acts here or shows that aren't four wall deals? For example, are all your shows four wall or not? Not all. No, I, it depends. Which, let me clarify with some of those of you who might not know what a four wall deal is. If, forgive me if I'm wrong on this, but it's essentially where an act comes in and they are the ones who rent the theater and buy their own marketing and hopefully sell tickets. I think is that most part the the original thing. You know, the hotels used to pay for all the entertainment. Yeah. And they would lose money in the theater or in the showrooms, but they didn't care because you know, these old mob guys who owned it sure. understood how much money they'd make in gambling. But then the beam counters came in in the 80s and everything went corporate. So every square foot of the hotel had to make a profit. And they would look at it and they'd sure. say, "Wait a sec, we're losing five million dollars a year on this square footage." They didn't understand but that's making you 50 million yes. in there. So they started tearing showrooms out or not paying people as much. And then, you know, it's a uh, supply and demand. So there's a lot of people willing to come in and take over. And, and just the hotel gives you the four walls and says, have at it. You can pay for everything and you can keep all the money. But that's what four wall usually is. And then worse is we'll pay you rent and you have all the responsibility yourself. So. Well, it sounds like you're taking a lot of chances, and if I'm not mistaken, our own mayor, Oscar Goodman, said that uh, Las Vegas was based on people taking a chance, and he referred to you as saying that you are a huge chance taker. 
not only because you're producing your own shows, but that, if I'm not mistaken, you're going into theaters that even in the past had not necessarily been so successful, and you go in and uh, make silk out of a sow's ear, as they say. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that shows my age. <laughs> Who says that? <laughs> that was nifty. <laughs> hey, rouge on a whore, was that, would that be better? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know, it, I think there's something wrong with me because I love a challenge and I see a distressed property and I go, could I make it work? I, you know, I, I shouldn't be doing that, but I do see a lot of uh, entertainment ventures that nobody else will do and I say, I now, think I can make it work. But. I, and I think one of the biggest chances you probably ever took in your professional life was going into not Coming only on the, this show. Yeah, I was going to say, that's <laughs> <laughs> the end of your career for no, sure. I have no career. Uh, there was a friend of mine who invested a lot of money into his own theater just a couple doors down from you. And for one reason or another, uh, that came to an end. And so some would say that maybe that was a risk buying this big, huge theater that is now called the Sax Theater. What were you thinking going into this gigantic thing? I'm sure it cost millions of dollars. And then not only doing that, but producing what looks like a multi-million dollar production, which in my opinion is one of the finest shows in Las Vegas. If you have never been to Vegas, and you want to come here and get a sense of what this city is all about, please, I urge you, go see Vegas the Show in the Saks Theater. Please tell us about how that got started, because I just had a chance to see that again for the other night. What a wonderful um, tribute to the history of the, the, the great city, the golden era uh, of how this city got started and the entertainers that made that happen. How, this probably was like a dream come true yeah. for you to do this, because knowing one, your love for Vegas this was, was really awesome. You know, I've done a lot of shows that I couldn't wait to get out creatively, mostly business-wise. I say, I, I can make money at this, so that's why I'm going to do it. And I think it'll, I can market it, and I think it'll work. And I've done country shows, which I'm not a huge country fan, but I've done all kinds of shows because the market needed it. But, um, you know, I do think the market needs a Vegas-themed show. There's yes. no Vegas-themed show. In all of Las Vegas, it's all French-Canadian and a lot of other things, you know? And, and that's what Vegas is missing, Vegas. But... Um, it, the opportunity came to get the theater. Uh, somebody, we won't mention names, bought a theater and built a theater yes. by my theater, so I think right. to compete with me, and <laughs> didn't quite make it. So right, I, right. I got the opportunity to take that theater over, and I said, I can't do it unless I have something that's going to really be big and really amazing to support that theater. And, and I thought about it, and I said, you know, I've always wanted to do a show about Vegas and the history of Vegas and the greatest entertainers of Vegas and everything I grew up backstage watching, you know, real entertainers that connect with an audience. And, and you know, once again, no offense to Cirque, because they really are fantastic at production. But, you know, I, I literally have fallen asleep at two Cirque shows, literally. And I was making fun of a guy that was fell asleep. I told my wife at cough, <laughs> I said, that guy's sleeping. I said, that's so funny. He's really sleeping. Ten minutes later, she's like pushing me, because you're snoring. I go, huh? <laughs> As, you know, they're fabulous shows, but they just don't have that connection like the entertainers used to. Well, let me tell you, I could go on for hours about what you're talking about right here. If you don't mind, we're going to take yeah. a short little break. When we come back, I want to talk more about Vegas the show and how it connects with those audiences. And, and we're here with David Sachs, Mr. Big Time Producer Pants. And so <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. I'm Chris Phillips, and you're watching Talk Tales on the Vegas Video Network. Hi, this is Scott Pritchard from Let's Bet. You're watching the Vegas Video Network. It's VegasVideoNetworkNot.com. You're not using this one, right? <laughs> Don't you dare use this one. <laughs> Everyone, welcome back and thank you for watching Talk Tales here on the Vegas Video Network. I'm Chris Phillips, and today we are so proud to have a, a, a dear friend of mine, and I would have to say probably the most handsome producer on the Las Vegas Strip. It's Mr. David Sachs from David Sachs Productions. <laughs> he currently has 14 very successful shows uh, running up and down the Strip, primarily at the Planet Hollywood Miracle Mile shops. He owns the V Theater and the Sachs Theater, which houses without question, probably my favorite show in Vegas right now, called Vegas The Show. And before we went to a break, we were talking about the fact that uh, with a lot of the shows in town right now, 
it's almost like there's a wall between the show and the audience. And in my opinion, in the old days, you would leave with the feeling of substance, like you really got something for your buck, and, right. and you got to know who that entertainer was, and almost as if you wanted to join them after the party at whatever little swanky get-together they were going to go to, and, and you just wanted to know about them and their lives. Whereas today, you, you really don't have any connection with the people in the show right. at all. That's the way I felt. You know, I just, I couldn't, t the locals here, and especially in entertainment, there's, there's a vibe and a buzz that what we all talk about, and how's the industry going and whatnot. And we've been talking about too many Cirque shows and, and that style for so long. And when I finally had the opportunity to, to put a show together that encompassed all of the greatest shows I've ever seen and the best from so Paul Desbergere and the best. Yes, and so, so tell us about some of the entertainers that you pay tribute to in your show. They're obviously my idols and obviously. Okay, we, we have. This is so cool. Well, I the show it. starts off in the Neon Boneyard. So yeah. we have the ghosts of Las Vegas past are there. They're all um, old. Um, like industry people, your bellmen and concierge right. and people. The people who make the city what it is. And they, the unsung heroes. And they are, they live in the uh, Neon Boneyard and they're there to make the, um, they want to keep Vegas's entertainment past alive so people don't forget. So they take you on a journey sort of through, through um, time and show you what, which they cherish so much, all these great performers. So we start off uh, in the 40s and go all the way up through the late 70s and sort of, but, but we have, oh my goodness, there's like 50, we have a live orchestra, full yes. live 11 piece orchestra. And may I say for somebody who has a 15 piece orchestra myself, thank you for putting musicians back to work instead of yeah. playing some silly little recording in the background. Yeah. That's such it's a relief such to a go into a show and to hear this full sound and then to get to hear uh, songs and to see performers emulating Frank Sinatra, Dean right. Martin, Tom Jones, Elvis Presley, Right. These are my Every heroes and your heroes, I'm sure. Pips, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. We even go through the 70s. Yeah, that's cool. I love that yeah. part now. That's really cool. With Elton John, John and Cher, and, and so everybody. It's not, it's not like a Legends in Concert. No, not, no. They're not impersonators, and that was a tough decision, too, because to, to, it's more like a Broadway musical, and they're showing these, these um, uh, ghosts of entertainment past are showing you, they're reenacting for you what it was like to be around back then. So they're not saying this is literally the person. So it's kind of like that that's a different twist on it and um well i don't want to blow this for anybody who's going to go see it but i one of my favorite parts of the show is is how you pay tribute to liberace <laughs> that oh, is yeah. such a cool i'm not even going to blow yeah. it but uh, you, you've got to see how they uh, uh bring him back to life so to speak and it's very very unique you know you know bad. and I, also i love um in the true spirit of the old vegas variety shows in the middle of your show you have other acts that come on and right. do a few things uh, within your show, right. you have this amazing magician, but I'll tell you, for my money, you have two individuals on your show that I think are probably two of the most talented people in Las Vegas, Sean and John. Right. In the Twin old... Brothers. Oh, man. Tap dancers. I, I wanted to do, if anybody out there knows, awesome. the Nicholas Brothers from yes. the 40s, and, and I really wanted to do, find somebody like that, and I searched everywhere and finally found these two twin brothers who are amazing. They're actually performing on the streets in, um, in L.A., and the, the Santa Monica, I forgot what it's really? called, the promenade. And uh, I, I said, I gotta get these guys on a stage and see what we can do with them. They've been phenomenal. I had a chance to do a uh, show on HBO where they were featured on there as well with them. And the coolest guys in the world too. The but nicest oh guys, I have such an amazing cast. And, and would you share a little of information about your featured dancer? She is a friend oh of mine and Tara that's Paul worth show. the price of admission right there to see her. You know, oh. the. The idea of the show. <laughs> Jeez, I have an ulterior motive where this conversation is going. Well, the, the reason when I put the show together, and like most things that I put together, everybody says you're crazy. It's not going to work. There's no way. Don't do it. You're crazy. And I, I called up Tiger Martina, my uh, old choreographer that I used to work with a long time ago, and he since moved to Broadway, uh, um, New York, and was on Broadway. I said, it's time, Tiger. And we hadn't talked in years. I said, it's time. We're bringing Vegas back. We're going to bring back that old, the, just, I want the dancers to take class again and want to be, just work their butts off two shows a, a night, and, and I want the greatest acts, and I want the greatest performers, and people who want to work at their craft and care again. I want to bring back that vibe that you and I grew up around. And um, 
I said, I want that Sid Charisse girl, oh, and I want this, it, and friend. I want that, and oh, we ended boy. up with this dancer, uh, Tara, who Tara, she's ended amazing. up being a star. Like, yeah, we, we worked amazing. together on something called Dancing with the Las Vegas Stars, where I made a fool out of myself, and she tried to help me become a salsa dancer, and she's easy on the eyes as well, may I add. She's amazing. And you know what, the whole cast, is, I think it's, and I haven't seen all the cast of all the other shows, but... Well, speaking of other shows, um, obviously growing up here in Las Vegas, you were influenced uh, in the entertainment community. What shows or entertainers inspired you and that mm. made you say, you know what, I want to do that? Who, who did you used to go see that, because I, I know myself, the, some of the first shows I ever saw was Tony Orlando at the Hilton back yeah. in the mid-70s and Frank and Sammy. I so they were terribly, who did you see that you I, thought, I, I, I want to do that? Those, I, I got to admit, I was so young and my dad would drop me off at uh, MGM and he'd do rehearsals for all the guys, Sinatra and everybody, and I'd run around, and, and there was a movie theater there, and I'd play in the arcade yeah. in the movie theater. I, this is the days before pedophiles, I think, because they just <laughs> would drop me off at a casino by myself, and I'd play all day. And then, um, you know, so I watched these guys, and I, I didn't understand at the time that I was having it. I just thought that was normal, sure. that people could connect with an audience that much and, and were so amazing. So I, for me, it wasn't until um, probably... You know, there was, I mean, I saw Copperfield producing my sister's show for so many years, and she had to work so hard because she hadn't been on TV, and she was doing some amazing things and working her butt off, and we went to a Copperfield concert, or concert show, and, and he just comes down, and there was a standing ovation. He hadn't done anything, and yeah. he just announced yeah, him. I said, like, wow, the power of TV, and... Makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And I said, yeah, so, so there was a lot of performers that I, I... I'm more of a student. I always look and... And study and why and what and what what's the audience looking at and why are they clapping now and so well, speaking of your audience we have somebody who's watching us live right now that's okay. in our live chat room and I think we may have another question if you don't mind Scott uh, what do they have to say uh, we actually have a bunch of questions oh my goodness wow. so keep coming very back. popular uh, so Jackie has a, a couple questions that I think are pr is pretty cool how do you know when a performer or group has it uh, and how do you go about picking them and then a follow-up have you ever picked somebody who you thought was a winner, but ended up, it, it didn't work out that way? Yeah. Okay, so the first part, everybody here in the audience and, and anyone who's not even in this business, you would know, that's why American Idol and all these shows are so popular, you know when you're auditioning people who's good and who's bad. <coughs> it's, it's easy, it stands out. I know in an audition for dance or whatever it is, I know within probably three seconds, I could tell how they walk, Sure. I could tell. Yeah, sure. They have that, it or not. have it. Yeah. You have to have it. So you can tell. That's easy. Um, picking somebody who you think has it and they become, they're not very good, that's, that takes experience because there are, it's going to sound very shallow, but this is my job. There are girls who aren't as attractive sure. in person. On stage, they are unbelievably they come alive. beautiful and sure. just amazing. And, Their aura. And the other way around, beautiful them. girls, and you get them on stage and they go, what happened? They don't look so pretty and they can't hold them. So, um, yeah, I've hired a lot of people who, mostly it's about attitude. I, I'm very old school. The show must go on. I work probably 18 hours a day. So if somebody doesn't have a good work ethic and... Now, how, yeah. how much of a handle do you have with kind of a hands-on approach to your shows in the sense that... I, this, this is what I find interesting. You don't consider yourself to be a performer now, do you? Because I know you're very state, you're, you, no. you're shy and bashful when it comes to no. getting up on stage yourself. How are you able to convey to them what you want them to do? Do you actually um, Sometimes I perform, implement some yes. of the, oh, yeah. the choreography? And, yeah, and, and they make fun of me. I'm awful. <laughs> I can't dance at all. I can't, but, but directing, I, I will show them what I mean. Um, but yeah, now I have stage fright. I hate performing. I can't do it, but I think that's what makes me good because I like to analyze it so much and see what what works. And you know, a lot of performers, yourself included, I'm sure, um, you know, you have your own mo on that stage and what you, what works for you. And I couldn't do that, but I, on the other <laughs> hand, are yeah. really good at analyzing because I've done it every time you've been on stage. I've been in the audience, watching and analyzing from a different perspective. So I'm really good at the other perspective. I think. Well, my perspective is usually clouded by a lot of Crown Royal. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is shit. So I like my perspective. Now, apparently, I'm not the only one who shares uh, in the opinion that you were one of the greatest producers because you've uh, received some amazing awards and uh, some acclaim 
over the last couple of years, starting with Oscar Goodman giving you the key to the city. And if I'm not mistaken, February 22nd is David Sachs Day. That's awful. In uh, <laughs> Las Vegas. That's impressive. Uh, um, that's just for charity stuff. Well, like I'll tell you, in Seven Magazine, a very popular uh, uh, local publication, has named uh, Mr. Sachs here Producer of the Year. What do you think of that? That's very impressive. That's pretty uh, cool. And then the UNLV College of Hotel Administration named you Industry Exec of the Year. <laughs> Where do you I, go I, from there? I used to teach at UNLV. But that, that doesn't hold a candle to something that was told to me earlier today. I'm driving here, and I get a call from a mutual friend of ours who, incidentally, I think is going to be a guest of ours in a couple weeks. And I told him, uh, I've got David Sachs coming on today. And he immediately said, you tell David, in my next life, I want to be David Sachs. Who would that be, do you think? Oh, God. <laughs> His uh, name is Chet Buchanan. Oh, Chet, yeah. Uh, and if you do not know, he is a very popular morning personality on 98.5 KLUC yeah, radio. And that was his opinion of you. And so, obviously. It's funny, but people think when you're a producer, you just sit around and audition <laughs> naked girls all day. And I don't do that. It's only half the day. <laughs> no. it's a, I, I've been around boobs my whole life. Yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> yes. No, I just, I, people always, since I was in high school, my friends would come over and we'd have all the showgirls laying out topless in the back and they'd all, they'd all be looking through the thing and I'd say, let's go play basketball. Go, no, no, we're looking at the girls. I've just been around That's it so That's your typical long. upbringing in Vegas, you know, sh Vegas, making showgirls in the backyard. Yeah, so for me, I just, it's just work, you Good know. Grief. Well, do you mind taking at least another question? Yeah, I know we have several. Scott, I'd like to get to a couple directly. of those. I, yeah. I love when people have something to ask. Yeah, these are some really good questions. Uh, FD wants to know, what would you suggest an act do to make themselves uh, more successful in Vegas? Is it best to seek an investor such as yourself and have them shop it around? <laughs> they try to get money out of me. <laughs> I, I, and by the way, I did not write that question. You know what? And this, <laughs> this is harsh, too, but um, this is the best advice I can give, whether they take it or not. It's acts are, there's thousands of them trying to get work, and, and I feel terrible that a lot of them can't get work, but they, they need to focus less on what they like and more on what the audience likes. What type of music does the audience want? Um, the costumes, choreography, what, what's the audience want? A lot of times they, they come out and it's just, wow, that's just really weird and not in a good way, and then I'll talk to them afterwards, and they'll say, wasn't that great? That's my, I wrote that song. Or <laughs> I go, ooh. Yeah. Well, you have such a wide variety of shows. Obviously, you've, you've kind of honed in on what an audience does, in fact, want. What I find interesting is the business side of things. Hmm. How do you effectively sell each and every novelty of each and every show? Um, do you hone in on a certain demographic with certain publications that you advertise in, or do you advertise things kind of in a general way to everybody in a universal oh type of manner? Or do you take a particular show, as an example, your Beatles show, and do you go after the baby boomers uh, yes. audience uh, oh, no, as compared you, to like the kids in their young 20s? I, I'm very, I'm more of a sales guy, more business than producing, unfortunately. I wish I could just do creative all day, but um, yeah, no, it, it's who's the market, really define the market, who's the exact target, and go after them with a vengeance, and sure. that's, that's it. It's really simple. Keep it real simple. The ad's simple. The campaign simple. Just, you know, like Obama used to say when he was on campaign, he said, the economy, the economy, the economy. He's going right. to stick to that so he can win. And, and I just stick to whatever it is I think is going to sell those tickets. Well, folks, we are talking with David Sachs, uh, one of the most successful producers in Las Vegas right now. We're going to take just one more short little break, and we come back. I'd like to ask you just a few more things. One of which is to how in the world do you get people in your seats where other theaters and shows around town are dropping like flies, playing to nobody. You're full every night. We'll be right back. You're watching Talk Tales with Chris Phillips. This is David Ivey from Pub Crawl. It's funny because is David from you should, you should, No, you should just leave it on. Hi, I'm David Ivey from Pub Crawl, and you're watching the Vegas Video Network. And scene. <laughs> well, howdy, friends. Uh, I'm sitting here getting very drunk with my friend David Sachs. Uh, uh. 
You guys want some? <laughs> Audience? No? I'm drinking by myself. This is awesome. Nobody likes to drink alone. He's drinking Crown or something. I drink like that. And this and that, but. All right, well, it's here if you buy it. Well, we are celebrating. Um, <laughs> all right, here we go. We got more. Our producer hates to be sober during the taping. Thank you. You're very welcome, Scott. Thank you. Uh, before uh, we went to a little break, we were talking about uh, the business side of things and how to get people to come to your show because bribe them. What do you? What's the secret? Because I know it's not just about marketing. When people come to Las Vegas, uh, they go to ticket brokers. Uh, they, I am assuming, are influential as to how that works in terms of getting people to push certain shows. You've got the taxi cab drivers giving their two cents. You've got the concierges offering up their opinions about shows. Mm -hmm. Are you able to hit all these different elements of people that are influencing a, a uh, ticket buyer? And yeah. how do you do that? I'm not telling. No. It's, there's, a sac, there's a David Sachs <laughs> secret, obviously, because you're I watched one of your things. shows, and you had somebody blaming me for... Paying high commissions. And <laughs> now, I don't even know how that works. I, you know, I don't sell tickets, and so I... I yeah, yeah it, it's, it's so simple. It is have a good product, promote it right uh -huh. with PR and advertising, and market it right, the right price, the right gimmicks, the right kickbacks, commissions, whatever it is. Sure, Just line whatever it, it takes. Right, and sure. then pray to God and get lucky. Well, but good still, for you. you could do it all, and it won't work. I've had plenty of shows that we did everything right, and they were standing ovations every night, and it still didn't work. Yeah, so I hear you. Well, I know, too, that I'd love to uh, talk about this for a second. Besides having your uh, theaters and your various shows around town, you've also recently opened something, I believe it's called the Stripper Bar. Oh. Now, I was just there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awful. Something true to my heart. You approach the stripper bar and you walk through the legs of a 31 foot tall stripper. That's right. That's mine, yeah. Not bad. How, now, how did this concept come about to I, I have, uh, implement uh, that right outside your theater? Inside, <laughs> outside of the V Theater, awesome. there's a bar and, that I have, and nobody was coming to it, and it's just a little hole in a wall, literally, like an order hole. And um, nobody was coming, so I said, I've got to figure out how to get people to walk over here and want to come in. So um, sitting across the street, eating uh, at the restaurant, looking at my theater with my wife, and I said, and I always come up with weird ideas, and I said, honey, what, what the hell that's should I put over there that's going to make people come? And, she's, and we had all oh, the stripper 101 class that I have. Um, we teach girls how to be strippers. <laughs> I love that, yes. That's that was, they were all over there and, and drinking. And, I, and she said, well, why don't you do a stripper 101 class? And I said, wait, how about a stripper-themed bar? And giant stripper, and you have to walk between her legs to get in, and it'll take a picture of, as soon as you walk in and look up her skirt, because everyone does it, it'll take a picture of your face. <laughs> <laughs> and you get caught with a pervert cam, and people will see the flash go off and go, all right, what the hell was that? i got to go see that. So. Oh. So it was just a, a whole marketing thing. But I got I to gotta admit, it hasn't done very well. It's been a disaster so far because oh, I really? think uh, because people, people are afraid it's to like, go in there. It's like walking under a ladder. They're too afraid <laughs> because they could, you could be seen inside there yeah, you know, right. looking at the girls. It's, a, it's like Hooters or something. It's, it's, I'm not going to say it's a family-themed restaurant, but it's um, as if strippers owned their own nightclub. So they're not really stripping. They can't strip. It's inside the mall. But well, I personally find it one of the coolest places in town to have a cocktail. So thank cool. you. But now, yeah, we're doing some things. Now we're going to redo it, and hopefully it'll be a success. Well, if you don't mind, I know Scott. I'd, I'd love to get to at least one or two more questions if we can before we run out of time. What do we got over there? Yeah, Ted wants to know. V Theater has been home to a variety of successful shows. What did the most successful ones have in common? Hmm, that's an I interesting question. <laughs> he owns them. <laughs> one. <laughs> I love your shows, too. Does you that so mean that you don't own some other no, shows? No, some of the other shows already existed, and they came in, and we partnered together and, and um, marketed. Uh, and I'm not blaming the other shows, but sometimes, a lot of times, people come with the concept, and they say, I have the show, and everybody can't wait to see it, and, and, and I'm going to sell it out, and millions will come. And I say, yeah, that's going to take a while to build, and you're going to have to have enough money, and you have to market. And sure, and some of the shows yeah. you have have been long-existing shows, like Tony and Tina's right. Wedding, that as an example. Great, yeah. it, 
That yep, came in with right. its own legs, obviously. Yep, yep, that one did. And some of them are upstarts, and, and if they... Um, as an example, up. as far as an upstart, uh, I have a friend of mine, Ryan Ahern. Yep. He has a show called Piano. Mm -hmm. Had that existed prior to no. coming in? I thought that was brand new. No, that's brand new, and that's, that's a long shot, just like any other show. I told him to. I said, hey, look, it's, it's like any other business. If you start a restaurant, let's say you buy land, you build, you hire an architect, you hire a chef, you do all this, you build this restaurant, and, and you, you have the menu items and everything, and on the opening night, you don't do so well. Do you close it down? No. So I told Ryan, I say, you know, if you stay with it and work it, and, and if your show's good and you do all this, you will last. But don't panic, because the first three months, it's like any other business, it's going to be horrible. May I have you talk so. to the hotels I perform at? <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. They don't share that eating for Yeah, I know. It's, it's the only in showbiz they think it should be successful opening night. But. Well, I, I have a feeling that a guy like you, even though you're working 24 hours on your existing shows, I know... I know you've got to have some ideas up your sleeve and, and have those ultimate goals as to the, the dream show that might not even exist yet. Are you able yeah. to talk to us about anything that might not only be up your sleeve in terms of a future production of some sure. sort, but is there something that you would dream of doing that you can talk about that maybe be a couple years down the line, perhaps? Definitely Broadway. I want a really? big show on Broadway and movies and some other other things as well. I, have you, you have any seen, projects have you heard, up your sleeve right now that you can talk about? Have you heard about? Book of Mormon? Have you seen it? No, I didn't even know. Do you have the soundtrack? Oh my The God. soundtrack to Book of Mormon, you oh, know, that, that's got to be pretty greatest. exciting. It's, oh, <laughs> my, my words, he's going to say it's his favorite. It's, uh, it's on Broadway right now. It's, really? The guys from South Park put it together. Oh, well, well <laughs> okay, well, that, that's a so, little lot. So, I, you know, I have a, an idea for something for Vegas. But you're a Vegas guy. You don't want to go off to New no, York, No, I, I have a Vegas musical idea I want to put together. and On the strip? Yeah. Yeah. So, so eventually you want to take over Las Vegas and uh, I just buy wanna, every theater and own every show. I just want to work hard and hopefully make enough money to pay everybody and keep expanding. Speaking of which, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, you have t over 250 employees currently working for you. Is that true? <laughs> Probably more. I'm not sure. It's up there. I can't control five. I can't, <laughs> I can't control one. <laughs> I tell you, it's hard. Yeah, you know, I was a producer, creative guy, and then all of a sudden I learned, oh, if you don't have butts and seats, you've got nothing. So I had to learn the business, and then I stuck mostly in the business, and then I kind of go back and forth, and then I have all these dreams and everything, but the more people you have in the, and the more shows and the more things you do, they own you. So now sure. I'm managing people all day, and I go, wow. This is tough, so I'm looking for a good general manager, if there's anyone out there. Oh, that's nice to know. Well, they, they, I was going to say, you have a tremendous responsibility to so many people's uh, uh, income and, and well-being. A lot. I, you know, that keeps me up at night, i got to say. When I see hundreds of employees and their families and their kids, and I say, wow, I'm responsible for this. I, I've got to make this profitable. I, I swear, I mean, I... I bought a truck. I'm, I'm like, well, I'll I tell wear you jeans. something. You, you have a hell of I'm an operation. I've been to the David Sachs, uh, I guess you might say, Nest, which is not just your typical little office. It's a 15,000 square foot office studio complex, uh, which is oh, kind man. of where I'm sure the brains of the operation yeah. is housed. And uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of doing some. Uh, rehearsals for a Michael Jackson oh, tribute right, right. show that we, we did there. in your studio. But right. you rent the place out too, don't you, to people like Carrie Underwood? Not very often, just every uh, now and then. Maroon 5, I think you had Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get the celebs and Sting and then all the shows, uh, Jersey Boys and Phantom, and a lot of those were rented out to put their shows together. I pretty much do it just so I can, I just love those shows, so I, I get to see it put together. Jersey Boys is so amazing. Have you seen it? Well, I've, I've not only seen it, I've had the pleasure of having... Uh, Frankie Valley, uh, oh, yeah. his name's Travis Clore. Yeah, great. He's he's coming. He's been a guest on my show on a couple different occasions where he comes in and he sings, uh, you know, a vintage Vegas standard with me. I have guests every week. And, right. And as I've told him, he I think he has a career in singing. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Not bad, little kid. Not bad. But uh, if you don't mind, I think we even have another question, Scott. Do we? Or? We do. We do. We do. Uh, Bill G wants to know uh, they are locals and they see comps for a lot of shows. What's the business thought behind that? Yeah, I, I, I think, too, which is interesting, is there, there are something called comps, and there's also something from uh, 
agencies who in fact fill your seats. Seat right. fillers, I think, is one of the right. companies. How do, do you ever have to use those, or how does that work? And um, when, now, is that I can't say never, and I, yeah. I think they serve a great purpose. Um, as you know, the, the city goes like this, you know. Particularly in the last couple of years, sure. Especially, and then when there's a convention in town where they control those people and they don't let them go see shows, they have too many functions, whether sure. it's NFR or whatnot. Right. There's times, and, and believe me, whether it's Cirque or anybody, they have downtime. So you, for the performers and everybody, you want to fill those seats. And plus, if you have a good show, you want word of mouth. So you'll invite some of the locals and, and to come in until everybody does it. Nobody likes to use those seat fillers because it's broadcast and everybody knows. Well, let me tell you this. I, I for a while, uh, was given the great privilege of performing in the Lance Burton Theater. Yeah. Uh, they gave me 14 weeks as a limited engagement with my 18-piece orchestra. And as you may know, that's a 1,200-seat theater. Right. We would sell two to 300 tickets. Right, which is great. But I had 700 people in the audience. Right. Seat fillers is my friend. <laughs> right, no, everybody. <laughs> I gotta tell you, a lot of those too, they go and they require them to write reviews and sure. they like it or not, so it's great survey, you know? I think those are great. It's a great service in this town because you know, there's so many great shows and I don't know if you feel this way, but the trend in the last couple of years has kind of been um, with people coming to town and not going to shows as much as they used to in the past, they're going to nightclubs and pool parties and the restaurants and shopping. And I think it's, I would think it would be tougher now to sell a ticket than it was, as an example, 20, 30 years ago, where every show, every performance was sold out. You know, granted, there's so many more shows and right. everything is dispersed so much more, but it's amazing to me seeing so many shows dropping like flies that you're still able to keep things going. And it, it's absolutely a, a testament to, obviously, uh, you know what you're doing. I'm, I'm excited that you're here. And I highly recommend to anybody, if you ever come to Las Vegas, go to Planet Hollywood and back in the Miracle Mile shops, you're going to be able to find the V Theater where there's at least 10 or 11 of your 14 shows. I think so. Uh, also, again, for my money, my favorite show in town at the Saks Theater is Vegas The Show. Right. It pays tribute to the golden era, the, the great days of the Rat Pack and Tom Jones and Elvis. And it's all put together by my very handsome friend, Mr. David Sachs from David Sachs Productions. And uh, we are so proud to have you here. Thank you, Josh. Again, my name is Chris Phillips, and you're watching Talk Tales. And I please urge you once again, if you have any questions for myself or any of our guests, please go to Talk Tales at VegasVideoNetwork.com. I would love to have you join us live every Monday at 4 o'clock. And uh, if you want, come to the studio audience, and drinks are on me. And me. <laughs> and he's going to bring champagne. Folks, thank you so much, and we'll see you next Monday. And David, yes, you're the coolest, my friend. It. Thank you. Congratulations, and uh, thank you. the best of success for you and all your shows. I'm drunk. <laughs> I really am. Drunk. I am, too. <laughs> wow. you're